and all the things that we think of, so many things that we think of that are aging changes are in fact hormone changes. So even skin wrinkling, they've done studies and women who are on estrogen and menopause don't look as old as women who are not on estrogen. <laughs> yeah, because your skin doesn't wrinkle as much. And so they've actually done studies where they take photos of women and they have uh, plastic surgeons who you know are skilled at evaluating people and they guess the women's ages and they guess you know at least a few years younger for the women who are on estrogen and that has to do with your skin tone and the support underneath your surface of your skin that happens um, due to estrogen so it can affect, and it affects the more important things about aging in terms of you know cardiovascular disease cognitive decline osteoporosis, all of those things are a lot under hormonal control. And so what happens during, during our life cycle is uh, that we are really hormonally optimal, or we should be, when we're about 25 to 30 years old. Now, I see a lot of young people who are very hormonally unbalanced, and um, I think that has a lot to do with stress, environmental toxins, a food supply that's not very good unless you really work on getting organ eating organic and you know getting food at the farmer's market which is grown close to you know where you're buying it, all of those things. But it's harder and harder for young people to stay healthy. And I think it has to do with all those various factors. But we are supposed to be hormonally optimized at age 25 to 30. And then things start going downhill. And so some of our hormones, even by age 45, have significantly declined. And it does things like make us not feel as vital, not have as much energy, not have as much endurance. And for some women, you know, a lot varies with the menstrual cycle. And you can see the ups and downs on the chart here. Um, Estrogen is in orange, progesterone is in green, and um, with changes, some women notice their mood changes during their menstrual cycle. Some women are very sensitive and their cognition changes during their menstrual cycle. Um, certainly PMS and emotional irritability have to do with hormone changes with the menstrual cycle. So we know that hormone levels will very much affect our moods. And, um, and then this is a chart that shows you hormone changes throughout life. So you can see on the left-hand side of the chart, it's very low before uh, the onset of menstrual period. And then in the teens, it gets pretty erratic until regular menstrual cycling is established. And, you know, a lot of you may remember when you were teenagers, your periods were really irregular. Um, and then later on in life, they tend to get more regularized, and they stay regularized until you get to perimenopause, which actually starts at age 35. And then you can see on the right-hand side, things get really erratic again until you are in menopause, and then your hormones are low, but they are stable. And some people do better when their hormones are stable, even if they're at very low levels, and other people other women feel worse when they're low. So um, it really it varies a lot from person to person. So can some, I, some people. Can I preface this part? This isn't like a scary movie. It's going to get really scary right now. <laughs> just, I'm going to tell you the ending. It's a good ending. So just bear with it. First time she went through this, I was like, wah, wah. <laughs> so, hang on. But the scary part's going to end in a minute. <laughs> Let's go. Bring it, bring it, Dr. Squad. Bring it. <laughs> So, um, and some women notice they feel, for example, when your hormone levels are super high during pregnancy, some women feel fantastic, other people feel horrible. And so you can see the differences in how it's very individual. Um, and these are some uh, slides about cognition, which um, I've been focused a lot lately on cognition and hormones. And it turns out women without estrogen don't do as well on tests of cognition. So um, this was a study about women who um, uh, having hysterectomies. If you have had a hysterectomy, 
before menopause and have your ovaries removed, it's been found that your brain speed is decreased by 15% from losing your ovary. So estrogen is really important. And then studies have been done um, on women who are on estrogen and off of estrogen in menopause, and the women on estrogen do better as far as cognition testing. So um, perimenopause, it says it lasts two to five years. That's kind of classically what's in the books. But like I said, it really starts at age 35. And one of the injustices that are done to women in their mid and late 30s who go into their doctors and say, you know, my periods are getting erratic and I don't feel like myself and things are changing is you're told, oh, you're too young for menopause, you know, like come back in 10 years. And um, there really are changes going on. So it's not recognized officially as perimenopause, but I can tell you the changes start a lot earlier than the medical system gives credit for. Um, average age of menopause is age 51. That's the average in our population in the United States. And um, the changes can go on for 15 years before that. It's just a long time, and it's a long time to suffer from things, and you don't have to. So these are the things that we, I commonly see as changes, not just menopause, but during this perimenopause time, um, problems like um, lower interest in sex, less energy, um, sleep not so good, emotional swings, feeling depressed or anxious, um, having brain fog, uh, not feeling as strong, and even if your weight doesn't change, having this shape shifting where you have more body fat and less muscles, so you notice like your pants don't fit as well, even though maybe your weight really hasn't changed, and a lot of those are hormone changes. Um, this is another one on estrogen and memory. So, uh, premenopausal and perimenopausal women perform a lot better on memory tests than postmenopausal women, and that has to do with having estrogen available. Um, and the fact that women who are on estrogen are half as likely to um, develop Alzheimer's disease. So, in terms of trying to figure out your risk benefit analysis, what you want to listen to, or what are the benefits of hormones, and then figure out what the risks are. So what happens with menopause? There can be premature aging, uh, increased risk of dementia, more body fat, more inflammation, bone thinning. Um, and for women, it's called menopause. And men don't have that abrupt change in their hormones like we do. We know our like, periods stop, and we have like, this definite, obvious sign that an era has changed or transitioned. Uh, but men do tend to get decreasing testosterone levels with age. Um, it's been called uh, andropause. The medical name is andropause. We sometimes call it menopause. <laughs> There's something called the grouchy old man syndrome um, because their testosterone levels go down and it makes them more irritable and angry. So some of the irritability that men have, just like, you know, Women tend to get more depressed and anxious. Men get more irritable and angry for the most part. Um, some of that is hormonal. So you can do something about it. You know, it's a shame to live with it. Um, so starting at age 30, men do go through changes. They start losing anywhere from 1% to 3% of their testosterone levels each year. Um, and a certain small percent of men already in their 20s have low testosterone. Um, and this shows uh, men at 30 plus, as many as 20 to 30 percent of them have low testosterone. And then by age 60, half of men have low testosterone. And it affects their well-being in a lot of ways. Um, diminished energy, diminished endurance, diminished athletic performance, um, less muscle mass, less uh, good sexual functioning in the Leo. Um, foggy thinking, I mean, a lot of things that happen with women. Mood, cognition, energy. So if your husband gives you a hard time, you just say right back at you, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> you're the, you're the, I'm still lying on the right. 
Oh, Steve here. Oh, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> he he is you want to leave, or are you okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get myself into it. He, he was <laughs> my, he knew what he did as you. Anyhow, uh, testosterone is important for men in terms of Alzheimer's prevention, just like women. So lower testosterone for men has been correlated with increased chance of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and we know that uh, giving testosterone to men can enhance their memory. And some of the testosterone, both in men and women, get converted into estrogen. And some of the benefits of testosterone for men may be that small amount of estrogen that gets produced. And we think that may improve brain function as well as cardiovascular health because estrogen is good for your blood vessels, good for your arteries. Does it matter how they get the testosterone, like if it's in pill form or? We'll talk about that, yeah. So, um, and again, the risk of going through these hormone changes, are same as for women, premature aging, um, increased chance of dementia, higher chance of cardiovascular death, um, inflammation, body fat, and bone thinning, just like for women. So, um, you can see some of the benefits of hormones and you can see some of the dangers of hormone decline. And so the real issue comes, what about replacing hormones? Is that an okay thing to do? And um, one of the problems is that most people, and it includes doctors, get our information from the media. And so newspapers, TV, magazines, and how do they decide what they're gonna print? They print what sells. Good news, doesn't sell. So you rarely read an article about the benefits of estrogen or the benefits of testosterone. Hearing about horror stories, that sells. So just about every time an article has come out in the last 17 years about estrogen, it's been based on a flawed study called the Women's Health Initiative. So even as recently as six months ago, there was an article that came out about some problem with estrogen. And I, <laughs> I said to myself, please don't tell me you're still evaluating the Women's Health Initiative. And sure enough, it was. So just about everything you read in the newspaper that's bad news about estrogen goes back to this study that was poorly conceived, poorly done, and the take home message is you don't take it the way they gave it. Um, the other thing that we have going on is big pharma wanting to make money. So a lot what's best for you is not what gets promoted. So I hate to tell you, but a lot of what supposedly is being done in the interest of your health is in the interest of somebody's pocketbook, not in the interest of your health. If we were really doing things in the interest of your health, we would be having huge lifestyle classes. Everybody would have access to gyms. Um, gym owners would get reimbursed by insurance companies. Um, we save know, lives. What? We save lives. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Uh, you know, we would be. Uh, you know, some insurance companies do give a break for people that you know show that they're proactive about their health, but we would have a completely different. Model. We would have a wellness model, not a fitness model. So that's what it would look like if we were truly interested in promoting health and not somebody's pocketbook. So given that this is the current system, it's always a matter of teasing out really what is reality, what is the truth, and what is not just lying in someone's pocketbook. So the Women's Health Initiative was uh, a study set up by the National Institutes of Health. Now it was heavily uh, promoted by Wyeth, which is a pharmaceutical company that makes Premarin. And they were sure, based on the results of a number of what are called observational studies, when you, you don't have a group that's on the hormone and a group that's off the hormone, but you just kind of looked, you look at thousands of people and say, wow, the people who are on estrogen don't have as many deaths as the people off of estrogen. And so it looked like hormones were beneficial, and they decided that they wanted to have a real study which compared hormones to placebo. So, a, you know, a really well set up study. Um, so they, um, uh, let's see which one is this? Yeah. So the results of the Women's Health Initiative came out in 2002, and 
that's why I'm mentioning it to you, that it's been 17 years and there are still newspaper stories based on the results of the Women's Health Initiative, all of which results need to be completely thrown out. Um, and this is, oh, well, this was a whole other issue because for men, low T or low testosterone standards really promote testosterone for men. And I think testosterone for men, for many men, is a good idea. This particular center says, um, your replacement therapy is performed in a comfortable atmosphere, not a stuffy doctor's office. Um, and that is the wrong approach to hormones. You don't want somebody just giving you hormones. You want somebody evaluating your health and wellness. So hormones are part of it, but there are a lot of other things that are important. So again, you have to sort out kind of the money-making parts of things from what really is the proper way to do things. So what happened with the Women's Health Initiative? Uh, they picked the wrong women. So the average age of women in the Women's Health Initiative was age 65, women who had never been on hormones. What was wrong with picking that age group? There's nothing wrong with putting 65-year-olds on hormones, but the fact was they already had some cardiovascular disease, most likely. They already had some plaque in their arteries. And what happened was they gave the wrong route of administration they gave an oral estrogen called Premarin. And when you give somebody estrogen in pill form, just like birth control pills, what happens? It increases your clotting. And when you increase your clotting, what happens? You get more pulmonary emboli, you get more blood clots in your veins, you get more heart attacks, and you get more strokes. So the take home message is not to stop using hormones, it's don't give it in pill form. There are safe ways to give estrogen that don't do that. So they gave the wrong route and they gave the wrong estrogen. They, and I'll show you a picture. They gave horse estrogen and they gave the wrong progesterone. And it wasn't real progesterone, it's called a progestin and it's synthetic and um, causes breast cancer. So the take home message is not hormones are dangerous, they cause breast cancer, heart attacks and strokes. The take home is don't use this stuff, use the same stuff. So Premarin got its name from pregnant mare's urine. And it's really a, you know, a study in animal cruelty of lining up all these horses, collecting their urine, taking the sediment, processing it, and putting it into pills for humans. It had horse estrogen in it, which is different than human estrogen. And so it um, forever causes, or used to cause a lot more side effects than other forms, natural forms of estrogen that our bodies make. Uh, breast swelling and tenderness, uh, bloating, water retention. And um, it contains dangerous forms of estrogen, which might be breast cancer promoting. And it's bioidentical for horses, not for humans. And when we say bioidentical, we mean chemically the same as what your body makes. And we have estrogen that's exactly like what your body makes. And it does not have these risks if it's given properly. And that's a picture of it. And it is protective, it's brain enhancing, and it does not have the risks if it's given in a topical, like a gel or a cream or a spray or a patch that pill has. And this is a comparison of a bioidentical topical estrogen compared to Premarin. And you can see on each of the points what the comparison is. So if you use estrogen in a patch, I use a patch, um, other people use creams, there's no increased risk of clotting. With Premarin there is. It actually, um, protects against heart attacks and strokes by uh, reducing inflammation in your blood vessels. And you all are probably aware that inflammation is the underlying cause of all chronic illnesses, whether it's heart attacks, strokes, cancer, or Alzheimer's, it's inflammation. And estrogen helps to lower inflammation in the blood vessels. It also helps to keep the lining of the arteries more flexible and, and improve the health of the linings of the arteries, so less likely to lay down plaque. Uh, 
primary because it was in pill form and it increased clotting factors, increased strokes, and increased uh, heart attack. And um, the bioidentical form of estrogen um, actually prevents Alzheimer's disease. We use it to treat Alzheimer's disease. And what happened with the Women's Health Initiative is they saw an increased risk of dementia, which they interpreted to mean Alzheimer's disease due to Premarin and Provera. It wasn't Alzheimer's, it was dementia due to mini strokes. It's another reason why people get dementia, but it's different from Alzheimer's disease. So estrogen, if it's given improperly, can cause dementia by causing mini strokes. So don't want to give Premarin, you don't want to take it in pill form, and, it, and you don't want people to get mini strokes. And let's see, and um, one of the um, natural forms of estrogen, and we use it in our hormone <coughs> replacement, it's called estriol, and it is a form of estrogen that actually protects against breast cancer and lowers the chance that cells can turn cancerous. Um, when they checked Premarin, and they had part of the study looked at women who were only on Premarin, not on any progestin, and in fact, it did seem to correlate with increased risk of breast cancer. So Premarin by itself does not increase breast cancer risk, but you don't want to take it because of the increased stroke, heart attack, blood clot um, risk. And then this is Provera, and uh, I've given this talk to a number of groups, and some women are still being given Premarin and Provera. I know that Kaiser does, and then somebody from Kaiser yelled at me and said, Kaiser doesn't make you use those forms, but in fact, you get them as part of your premium if you use Premarin and Provera. If you want a different form, you have to pay out of pocket. So oh, premium, so they can off you sooner and they pay less for you. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to say this, Dr. Scar will say it, but I, if your doctor has prescribed you the pill form, I think it's time to leave your doctor because he's dumb, right? He's not doing research. Sorry, I just think it's it's the or research is out yeah. there, or she is not paying attention and she's not updating her certs and her license like she should be. So just I'm going to put it out there because she won't um, leave that doctor. Save your life. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing, about that. Yeah. And well, that one thing we know about new medical information, this isn't new, right? It's 17 years old. It takes 17 years for something new to get generally accepted and and you know kind of used as common knowledge in the medical profession. Very slow to uptake new information. So this has been going on the last 17 years, and most doctors will give you their hormone re recommendations based on this. They haven't updated in 17 years. That's bad. Mm. It's not good. <laughs> and so yeah. Is it just this form? Like, is it just Provera, or is it other forms of, um, like, like the Nexpanol and things like that that are still, I guess, putting it in like not like in a patch? I think you need to explain the, what happens in the liver. That would, right, that and what is the S1 on? Next one is the implant yeah. in the arm. <laughs> right, so I'm not exactly sure what's in that one. I don't know if that's a form of Provera or not. I don't know, I just know it's I know your plant, but I, I don't know that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, what Ann is referring to is that um, in terms of estrogen, when you take something by mouth, it goes into your digestive system and it gets processed through your liver before it goes into your bloodstream. And it's during that liver processing that you induce clotting factors. So if you use something in a patch form, you never swallow it, it never goes through your liver, except ultimately to get broken down, but it does not have what we call that first pass that induces clotting factors. So that's the reason why a topical skin form or a vaginal form of estrogen will not induce clotting factors. Um, Provera is a synthetic progesterone. And you have to realize that a lot of these uh, compounds have been known, the bioidentical forms have been known for years, but you can't patent a natural mm -hmm. substance. So, you can't patent progesterone, you can't patent estradiol. 
So in order to have something where you could get market share, you had to have a, a patented product. And that's where using a lot of synthetic products came in. Um, before prednisone, we had pregnenolone. And pregnenolone is a great anti-inflammatory. and doesn't have a lot of side effects of prednisone. You can't patent pregnenolone. And so they came up with a synthetic form, which is prednisone, which if anyone's been on prednisone, you know it has a ton of side effects. And the same thing applies to progesterone. Um, so there is a commercial form of progesterone, and how they got it patented, they put it in a peanut oil matrix. So they didn't really patent progesterone, they patent their uh, delivery system. And the same thing goes with patches that are available commercially, they patent the delivery system. Um, and so what ended up happening is somebody came up with a synthetic progesterone because they wanted something they could patent and, and get market share, and they came up with Provera. And Provera has some um, similarities to natural progesterone, but then it has a few chemical differences, and those chemical differences make all the difference. And so uh, women on Provera, first of all, tend to have a lot of side effects like irritability that we don't see with natural progesterone, which is very brain calming, helps your mental focus, helps your mood, that doesn't happen with Provera. And um, Provera actually had anti-progesterone effects, and you want progesterone because progesterone is good for your brain, your bones, your mood, um, and it has anti-cancer properties. And Provera is cancer causing, and I'll show you a graph in a minute. So this is a picture of bioidentical progesterone. And Provera looks similar, but it has some other side groups sticking off the side. And this is a side-by-side -side comparison of progesterone and Provera. So progesterone is uh, something that inhibits breast cancer cell growth, and Provera stimulates it. So the women who were on Provera had a 30% increased risk of breast cancer. That's really significant. So you've got to be on a safe form of estrogen so you don't increase your risk of breast cancer. What else? Um, and when progesterone was combined with the bioidentical estrogen of clomiphene, there was no increased risk of breast cancer, but there was with Provera. Um, and I talked about heart attack and stroke prevention. Um, oh, and diabetes risk. So Provera increases your diabetes risk, which of course is not good for your long-term health. Um, statin drugs do too, so if any doctors are trying to get you on a statin medication, chances are you don't need it if they don't do anything for women and they increase risk of diabetes. So Provera increases risk of diabetes, which then increases your risk of cardiovascular disease. So you really don't want to be on Provera, and some doctors are still giving it, so be very careful. Yeah. So is, is Prometrium a Prometrium is the commercial form of bioidentical progesterone. So that's fine, yeah. And sometimes it's just called progesterone, they'll give you a generic, or they'll call it Prometrium, which is, that was the company that put it in a peanut oil matrix so that they could patent the delivery system. But it is bioidentical progesterone, and it's fine unless you have peanut allergies. And then um, this shows you the binding capacities and what it means um, for the different things I told you about. So there are two types of estrogen receptors. There are, well, two main types, estrogen alpha and estrogen receptor beta. And estrogen receptor alpha is like putting your foot on the accelerator as far as growth of cancer cells, breast cancer cells. And estrogen receptor beta is like putting the brakes on. And so you can look at these different components. So estrone has five times the activity in terms of accelerating breast cancer growth as in stopping it. And the primer in the horse's urine has a lot of estrone-like products in it. It turned out it actually didn't increase breast cancer risk, but we're concerned because it has so many products that are like estrone. Um, estradiol, so we women, uh, humans, have three types of estrogen. Estrone is one of them. Uh, 
Estradiol is our most potent estrogen. It's what really keeps our brains, hearts, bones, skin healthy. And it has one to one in terms of promoting breast cancer or slowing it down. It really does not have an effect on breast cancer. Estriol, on the other hand, is protective. And so it has more of the putting the brakes on breast cell cancer growth than it does on promoting. Let me just finish going through this. Um, Premarin has a strong accelerator and a weak brake. So promoting breast cancer. And so does Provera. Increases the growth of breast cancer cells and doesn't do much to stop them, as opposed to regular progesterone, which decreases breast cancer cell growth and puts the brakes on any growth. Yeah. So the estriodiol, is okay to take in the pill form as the estrogen? You don't want to take any estrogen in pill form. Okay, so the estriodiol, is that the estrogen? All three of these are estrogen. Estrone, yeah. estradiol, and estriol are all estrogen. And you're not supposed to You don't to want to take any of them in pill form. You're in a bind if you need contraception and you're on an oral contraceptive. I mean, but we're talking about other uses of estrogen. And so people who need contraception, and there are other forms of contraception besides the pill, but it's pretty well known that the birth control pill induces blood clots. It's rare. And a lot because it's given to younger women, we don't see as much blood clots and uh, problems with pulmonary embolism and things like that as we would in an older group of women. Well, I take the estriodiol in the pill form. Mm -hmm. It's like one milligram. Right. You should not be in a pill form. Even if it's estradiol. Yeah, even if it's the bioidentical one, it should be topical. That's what you should. Yeah. <laughs> And um, well, this is from a talk that I give about hormones in the brain. And um, when they, for a long time, when they looked at estrogen effects in women's cognitive function, most of the time estrogen showed benefits, but a significant amount of the time it didn't, and people were not able to figure out exactly why. But in mice, they consistently show a benefit from estrogen. And they put mice in these mazes and then they have to figure their way out and how long it takes them to figure their way out. You can judge their cognition. Well, it turns out mice are always given the bioidentical forms of hormones. They also have estradiol because they're mammals. And that's why the studies routinely show that cognition was you know, benefited by being on, on estradiol. A lot of the studies in women were with Premarin or other forms of estrogen, and those don't work as well, and they may not work at all. And so um, my takeaway was that rats get better treatment than women in a lot of cases. Yep. So, and then um, talking addressing testosterone, because that's an issue for men, and um, people have concerns about testosterone. Uh, prostatic cancer and testosterone. And that has also come from, I would say, so much as rise for money, but a lot of misinformation historically. And so um, ultimately what more recent studies have shown is there's no relation between testosterone levels, measuring testosterone levels in blood, and risk of prostate cancer. So if you have higher testosterone, you're not at increased risk of prostate cancer. Um, there's no relation between using testosterone, because when people say, okay, well that's some of these natural testosterone levels, what happens when you give men testosterone? No relation between giving testosterone and prostate cancer risk. So all of what's gone on historically has been a lot of misinterpretation of very old data from the 1940s. Um, and people are always worried in men that have had prostate cancer, should they, is it okay for them to take testosterone? And a lot of doctors won't give it. But it really depends on whether the doctor's up to date on things or not, because it's been found that giving testosterone after prostate cancer does not increase the risk of recurrence. Um, another misnomer was that testosterone causes cardiovascular disease. 
that's not true either. And um, it may even help with certain forms of heart disease called congestive heart failure, which is when your heart gets dilated and the muscle doesn't work well. So a lot of what, um, I don't have all the studies up here to show you, but this is a compilation of a lot of scientific studies that show the testosterone is safe. So in terms of you know what you're going to do about your situation, um, and this is always the question in anti-aging medicine is, you know, people say, well, it's not natural to take hormones. Like, you know, I'm just going to let nature take its course. And, you know, when you look at the comparison and say with diabetes, right, you're giving people insulin and that's a hormone and you can let nature take its course and diabetics would die because they need the insulin. Um, People die, it's estimated that there were 50,000 unnecessary deaths per year when the Women's Health Initiative came out and women wholesale went off their hormones. There was a, a really a famous OBGYN that did a statistical analysis of how many deaths are prevented by being on estrogen and what it meant that so many millions of women went off their estrogen. And so you don't think about the lives that are saved, the brains that are saved, by being on hormones, mainly, like I said, you hear the bad press, and that's kind of what sticks in your mind. The more that we've worked with people with cognitive decline, early Alzheimer's, and uh, the more I read about the benefits of hormones and keeping your brain healthy, and it turns out, you know, as people are aging, this is like one of the number one, probably the number one concern, because who wants to, you know, live if you don't have your brain working? So um, we have what we call active management of aging or successful aging to slow down the aging process. And like I said, hormones are a piece of it. Lifestyle is so important. Avoiding toxins, exercising, eating well, eliminating refined carbs, getting enough sleep, meditating and reducing stress. So it's not all hormones, but it's hormones as part of an overall plan. And um, I feel like, oh, we have a lot of spelling errors and problems here. But anyhow, I feel like your health is a three-legged stool. So there's the physiology, chemistry, you know, biology part of it. There's the lifestyle part of it. And then there's the mental, emotional, and spiritual part of it. And all of those have to be addressed to really be healthy. Uh, these are the hormones that we use in our hormone restoration program, not on everybody, but on most people, because most people need them, they're low in them. Um, pregnenolone is an important hormone that diminishes with age, and it, uh, like I said, is very anti-inflammatory, but it also functions as a neurotransmitter in the brain, in the memory part of the brain. So being on pregnenolone helps to maintain your memory. Thyroid, I mentioned, you know, it just affects everything across the board in terms of the speed at which all the chemical processes happen in your body. I mean, when your thyroid is sluggish, your brain gets slowed down, your protein synthesis gets slowed down, people get brittle nails, dry hair, dry skin, constipation, low energy, all those things are like, you know, somebody's turning the thermostat way down. DHEA is another really important energy and vitality hormone, and this is a hormone that is, when you're, by the time you're 45, it's half of what it was when you were 25. And so it's important for immunity, blood sugar regulation, energy and vitality. So I think it's probably one of the most important hormones that we use that help people feel better. Uh, melatonin we use to help kind of orchestrate all the other hormones, it also has antioxidant and anti-cancer properties. And then vitamin D is actually a hormone, it's not a vitamin, and its structure is very much like the structure of the hormones that I showed you. And so vitamin D is involved in 400 different processes in, in your body. It has to do with your energy, your mood, your weight, your uh, cancer fighting ability, your autoimmune fighting ability. Um, vitamin D is really important. So those are all the things that we use. And the benefits that we see, and you know, I just had somebody, um, actually I talked with the Rotary Club, and one of the people, she became a patient, she's like, 
I'm so relieved. I thought I was going to have to live like that the rest of my life. You know, her energy was down, her moods weren't good, she wasn't sleeping well, all that's like pretty typical, you know. So you, you don't, that was what Amanda was saying, like the light at the end of the tunnel. You don't have to live with all of that. And so these are some of the things that we see that people benefit from. Progesterone is very brain calming, and we call it nature's valium. It, helps your mental focus, it decreases your ability, it helps you sleep, it makes you feel calm. So a lot of like the turmoil that you go through in perimenopause has to do with your progesterone levels decreasing or being very erratic. Um, and it also does a number of other things. It helps with migraine headaches and for women who are still in the menstrual cycle part of their lives, it can help PMS. That's one of the hormone changes that during that up and down cycling during menstrual periods causes premenstrual syndrome. And um, estrogen, people, you know, I think it came from um, chickens. People are always worried, they hear about chickens getting hormones to fatten them up, which they do. Um, but interpret it for humans, thinking that you're gonna get fattened up. And what happens when you're on estrogen is it actually does help you maintain your hip-waist ratio. It helps you keep from going through that body composition change that happens during perimenopause. Um, it maintains your body mass and reduces your mid-abdomen visceral fat. So, and it also improves your, your insulin resistance and makes you less likely to have diabetes. So, a lot of things that people worry about based on chicken, um, you know, capons and things that don't apply to humans. Um, and this is one of those observational studies, so you, you know, you have to take it with the understanding, but um, what they found was there were fewer deaths in estrogen users than in non-estrogen users. And um, the criticism that people have of these observational studies is maybe the women on estrogen were people who were more proactive about their health, not only in terms of getting on hormones, but maybe exercise and sleep and all the other things that we know play a role in maintaining your health and, and preventing premature death. So that's the thing we never know about these observational studies. But certainly when people are worried about being on estrogen, it does not make you die sooner. If anything, it helps you live longer. And uh, yeah, significant reduction, 40 to 50% reduction in cardiovascular disease in women who are on estrogen. And let's see. So women who were women who are not having any cognition problems and memory is fine may not notice a change when they're on estrogen. But women who are having some memory problems, some brain fog, some confusion, not able to like multitask like they used to, they did show an improvement with being on estrogen. So if you're good, it doesn't necessarily add to it, but if you're having problems, it can help. That's the upshot of the slide. And then um, testosterone, I talked about the benefits in terms of libido, muscle mass, energy, cognition, applies to women as well as men. And then, like I said, these are the things ultimately that I see when people feel better, you know, when you can get through your day and you don't feel like it's a struggle. And I have people say, you know, like I have these to-do lists I never get through. I do what I have to do, but then I don't do any more. I go home from work and I crash at night and I don't do things I enjoy because I don't have the energy. I just do what I have to do to get through the day. You know, just kind of basically surviving rather than thriving. And so um, those are the things that I see as benefits of people being on hormones, both hormones, men and women both. I'm happy to take questions. So maybe we should turn this off. Oh, no one ever started it? Do we not push it? Do we not? I thought we pushed it. It says start live stream video. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got a notification that we started. From us or from Amanda? Oh, yeah. I didn't record it, so I can still send you the video. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, because oh, I sent out a message to my list. I thought somebody had pushed it. I thought he pushed it. I, I, one of us. Yeah. No. It was 
be free. Uh, they have some other class besides are in them, so I, I'm not sure that they're, you know, really the biggest alternative. Probably class is the best. Okay. And then um, body products have a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Pesticides are endocrine disruptors, so eating organic. The hormones that are in beef and chicken are endocrine disrupting. And then for some women, um, not properly breaking down estrogen. And so that's something that um, regular doctors don't test for, but we test for in functional medicine, is see how you metabolize it. And if you metabolize it to certain metabolites that are more likely to cause endometriosis, they are more estrogenic. Then there are things that can be done to change the metabolism using supplements. Oh, where yeah. can I go to do some more testing like that versus like to her? Yeah, <laughs> we do that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I didn't bring it. I have some cards and stuff. I have. I can send her information out too. But we get. Are there natural um, forms of, like, can you eat estrogen, or can, is there like a plant or something that you can ingest and that? That will have an estrogen mm -hmm. effect? Um, not really. People will you try to use black cohosh for things like hot flashes, and it's not clear that it works any better than placebo. So, yeah, it's hard to get these things through food. Mm -hmm. It's even hard to get vitamin D through food. You can get it through sunlight, but you can know, also vitamin D fortified milk or something. Mm -hmm. Hard to get it through food. So when you get things like that, like supplements, I see them say like phytoestrogen and stuff like that. Right. So those are herbs that are claimed to have similar effects to estrogen, like black cohosh. But they um, still process through the liver and give you that bad. Outcome. They won't. No. No. They won't because they're not estrogen. Oh. But they work. Like I said, kind of 50-50. It's not. You know, it's not clear whether it's placebo effect or they really do something. They're not necessarily causing any harm? No. Okay. No. They wouldn't cause blood clots. They don't? No. Okay. Estrogen, there is a progesterone cream that can be sold over the counter that really is progesterone. Um, and that has helped some people with PMS. It's very low amounts. It, it will be sold over the counter, not as a prescription. But any estrogen, progesterone, or higher doses, uh, estrogen, testosterone, or higher doses of progesterone have to be a prescription. So if it says estrogen and it's at Whole Foods, it's not estrogen. They're sick claiming that it has some maybe estrogen-like effect, but it can't be estrogen. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a preference of a patch versus uh, estrogen topical cream? I don't. I think <coughs> you know what works most comfortably for you. For some people with cognition problems, uh, being on a patch, which keeps a more level estrogen level, you know, more even estrogen level, works better for their cognition. For people that are very sensitive to changes in estrogen, even applying it once a day and then their estrogen level goes down by the next day, for sensitive people can be enough to make their cognition go down. But that's unusual. So for the average person who's getting relief from uh, or prevention with um, estrogen, I think any of those forms are fine. There are sprays, there are gels, there are commercially available patches that are commercially available. There are compounding pharmacies make creams and gels. So there are a lot of different ways to get it. As long as it's estradiol and or estriol and it's in a topical, goes through your skin. <coughs> Do you do blood testing? Is that how you figure out what? We do do blood testing. We do blood testing to check hormone levels, and then there's urine testing to test these different metabolites. We're trying to figure out how somebody's breaking down their hormones. We use urine testing. Yeah, and some, some places use saliva testing. I haven't found that to be helpful, but there are doctors. It's kind of whatever the practitioner is most comfortable with and has experience with and can correlate with like how your patients feel is the best thing to use. And so um, there are doctors who use 24-hour urine collections mm -hmm. to test for hormones. I just feel like that's a lot asking somebody to do quarterly. <laughs> I mean, it's really a hassle doing 24-hour urine collection. Um, but yeah, but I, I use serum, use blood tests except for looking at the metabolites that has to be done in urine. And we don't use a 24-hour urine collection. <laughs> we use another spot urine. 
You mentioned about the migraine, so my sister, I believe, but she and I both, I mean, we've always had headaches, which I also think is hormone related, but mm -hmm. then um, since going through menopause, we've gotten, her, she gets them way more. She's actually on a, a migraine study right now. Uh -huh. um, so, she, so I get them way less frequently, but I do think it's related to hormones. And so I was interested in, like, can you talk about that a little bit? Like, sure. Because that, um, that would be, because I'm one of those people who believed all the other stuff. I don't like to take stuff. I don't even like taking the truck when I have a migraine, but so I believed all the breast cancer and the things about the hormones. So what you say makes a lot of sense because I'm, I mean, I, don't, I just don't like to take stuff. I like mm -hmm. to work out and eat healthy and do mm -hmm. that more. Yeah, so fantastic. can you talk a little bit about the Sure. Relation? So what seems to happen with migraines <clears throat> is the, the worst thing for migraines are changes in hormone levels. And so we very typically will see people who uh, are in the menstrual reproductive phase of their lives and a week before their period, when estrogen goes down, unless you've gotten pregnant, a migraine will get triggered. And a lot that I would see is women who with perimenopause because then the estrogen gets a lot more erratic and you can't count on it being about once a month. It could be multiple times a month, estrogen's changing, is I would give very small amounts of estrogen to kind of fill in the gaps, not just significantly raise the level overall, but just to be there for when the level drops way down, not have it drop so far down. And that I found to be helpful for women who get migraines triggered by the hormonal cycling with their periods. Um, progesterone also it probably plays a role in it because progesterone levels decrease about a week before a period starts unless you're pregnant. And so um, also filling in with progesterone. And so what I've observed with women with migraines and menopause is some women feel better once the ups and downs stop. Even though their hormone levels are low, not having these varying levels really improves things. I've seen other women who when it's low like that, it's migraines all the time. It might be, yeah. Yeah. And migraines are very complex. I mean, you, I would say it's one of the things we're not the most successful at relieving. Like all the other, like menopause and all that, I think like your energy, your libido, your, you know, moods, all of that, that's really fixable. Migraines are so complicated. They can be due to food allergies and sensitivities. They can be due to environmental factors, stress factors. You know, it's like an electrical storm in your brain. It is a very big event, and um, hormones play a role. And I think for some women, it's been a you know, relatively easy fix to go on hormones. Um, but I've had other people who just continue to get, you know, every few days, bad migraines. But um, if, it, if for your sister, if things got worse with menopause, she might want to look into just starting like very low dose and seeing if that will decrease the frequency or the intensity and just stay on a steady dose as possible. So for somebody like her, you would want a patch where it doesn't even go up and down in a 24 hour period. Like the patches you change twice a week. So it stays pretty level for a few days and it goes down and put a new patch on. But something like that might be helpful to her. And for her, and um, we use other things too. We use um, CoQ10 can be helpful for migraines, and uh, fish oil, uh, vitamin B6. She's tried so many things. Yeah, so people with really bad migraines have usually tried it all. But if she hasn't tried hormones, so very low dose might be helpful. That's the one thing she has Yeah, yeah, she might have tried and tried in a patch. Yeah, they make the patch in tiny doses. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. The other, are we okay as far as time? Okay. I have a question about the study. So if the study was done 17 years ago, is there a new study happening? There are new studies all the time. They don't get publicized uh -huh. because they don't have horrible news. Uh -huh. So, yeah. So there are lots of studies that show benefits or show no increased risk of cancer. There's a huge study in France, 10,000 women using bioidentical hormones, no increased risk of breast cancer. You didn't hear about that study. That's terrible though, but that's big pharma. I think big pharma is a lot to, to, to Yeah, because if it's not going to push a lot of yeah. that. That and the media. Yeah. yeah. And media. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I know. Every time someone says, oh, there was a hormone article in the paper and it showed
Shalom Allah wrote something. He's like, oh, I know someone that's health initiative again. Of course, the newspaper doesn't say it, and I have to go like looking up the backstory, and then sure enough, it's not in the study. Well, I've definitely been one of those people who believe that and read that. Because again, I don't, I like, like I said, I don't like to take, I don't yeah. like to take stuff. Then you read that, and you're like, oh, no thanks. Right, another reason. Not there, there was one positive uh, article in the newspaper by this doctor, um, name was wrong. He's actually an oncologist, and he feels that estrogen is beneficial for women. And I sent out a blog post, it was last year, and I said, like, finally, a positive article in the newspaper. It was one article, you know, boom, and then it was gone. I think it was in the LA Times, it was like an op-ed kind of thing. But yeah, he's an oncologist who's like, he's written about hormones for 20 years. doing, 
you'd feel a lot worse if you weren't doing it. This is what I've observed. The women that come to see me, who, like they're, they're eating well and they're sleeping and they're working out with Amanda and um, taking care of themselves with stress reduction and still don't feel good. It's just like that hormones are like the missing piece. Yeah. You'd be in a lot more shape and you would have been in a lot more shape a lot earlier in life if you hadn't been doing that. So it's not that, I mean, that's very beneficial. It's just like there's a missing piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and, and Amanda sees Dr. Squire. <laughs> <laughs> and she and does people, all the right things for us. Yeah, and, and people like yourself that are doing everything usually respond really quickly and feel better right away. This other lady I was telling you about from the Rotary, she does all of that, <clears throat> was still just her energy was terrible. And she plans like all these conferences and she's very active volunteering and was like barely scraping through, but doing all the rest of it. And it's like in the first month, she was like, tell you, I feel a lot better. I mean, that's what she said. I'm so glad I didn't have to live like that the rest of my life. Yeah, that's how I feel, too, because, I mean, for me, I have a really stressful job, and I've always been super high energy. I look back, like, my, my family will show, like, home movies, and I'm like, oh, like, I'm never standing still. And people are like, how do you have so much energy? But I can tell myself I'm not sleeping very well. I'm really tired. I still have a lot of energy compared to most people, but it's not me. And I feel tired, and I feel like I get home from work, and I'm just like, I don't want to, I'm just done, I'm dry. And that is not me, for sure. So, and I do all those other things, but I mean, I'm definitely not. Yeah, um, you know, I have that number of people can text if, uh, let me see if I have it in my phone. I usually make a slide of it, and I forgot to do that. I have a few of the flyers back here too, but I yeah. have a number for sure, because we have a number you can text if you want like a copy of the slideshow or you want a free consult. I was supposed to have a slide up about it. Yeah, if you uh, write this phone number down, 562. 280. Oh, okay. 562-280-2191. And that sends us an email message. If you give us your name and email address and just say, I'd like a copy of the slides, or I'd like to be on your email list, or I'd like a free consult, we'll get back to you next week. So it's a really good way to do it. I had one question about the um, for that, what's the best way for, for guys to ingest it? Is it like a patch? It should be topical or a patch. So, so the thing with testosterone is <laughs> testosterone gets broken down. If you take natural testosterone by now, it gets broken down and it's ineffective. So they end up needing to make a synthetic testosterone. And those synthetic testosterone are very bad for your health, cause liver cancer and a lot of other problems. So it's not quite, the, the risk for being on oral, but because it's these really bad synthetic ones. You can't take testosterone, natural testosterone in oral form, it gets broken down. Oh, so, uh, like so you've got to be done as a patch in there. There aren't patches for women, but there are patches. Men have, men, when they get testosterone replaced, it's about 100 times higher amount than women get. And so there are patches out for men, but you can't like cut them apart or anything for women. They're like way, way too uh, potent. So we have a compounding pharmacy and they make up gels and creams. Okay. But it has to be up on the skin. Okay. Can't be taken by mouth. And that goes for men also. So and many testosterone supplements out there, so. Well, there are, and a lot of the supplements are um, things like uh, amino acids, you know, which will build up human growth hormone, and I think do the amino acids get promoted for building testosterone? I think they do. Yeah. Yeah. I think they do. Yeah, yeah, because, well, it depends if you're training. Right. You have to actually train and use your brain. And use the amino acids. Yeah. 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 But yeah, the same thing goes, none of the supplements actually have testosterone in them. It has to be a prescription. And it not only is a prescription, it's a, um, Schedule two, meaning it's treated as a narcotic. Like, wow. they keep very close track. I have to report every month who's on testosterone and verify. Oh 
case your weightlifting competitions are an athlete. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what about competition? So if a 30 year old comes to you and tells you they have low testosterone but don't bother testing them, they're an athlete. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I think that's why. I don't treat people who are 